Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's GeoPRC Friday Forum. GeoPRC is a Government of India scheme sponsored by the Ministry of Minority Affairs. It is aimed at arresting the population decline of the Parsi Zoroastrian community in India. And in keeping with Parzor Foundation's objective to preserve and protect vulnerable human heritage, at these Friday forums, we talk about the Parsi community, its doings, and the many and the many contributions to society. Today, you will see an engaging presentation on Dada Bhai Roji and the Global Zoroastrian Community uh, by Dr. Dinyar Patel. Dinyar is a historian of modern India. His areas of focus are Indian nationalism, the city of Bombay, and the Parsi Zoroastrian Community. He's currently an assistant professor at the SP Jain Institute of Management and Research in Mumbai and was previously at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Dinyar Patel earned his PhD from Harvard in 2015. He has since co-edited uh, two volumes with the Oxford University Press and his first book, Noroji, a pioneer of Indian nationalism, was recently published by Harvard University Press. Uh, before I hand over, I'd just like to remind the audience that we'll keep the last few minutes for question and answers, and uh, you may please leave your questions as comments. Thank you. Over to you, Dinyar. Thank you, Kritika, for that introduction, and uh, thanks to, to Parzo and Jiva Parsi for having me uh, here to pre present one of the, the Friday Forum events. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, begin with the presentation. Can, can you see the presentation right now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, good. Great. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll mention at least uh, a, a little bit about my connection to Parzor, but but first uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, the audience one or two questions in, in the sense of, you know, whenever we, we talk about someone from history, um, oftentimes, you know, the particular accomplishments that put, that person has done is not, you know, entirely well known. So, you know, I, I, I would like to ask the audience, at least at the beginning, um, if they know any of the specific contributions that Dadabai Naroji uh, made to the uh, Zoroastrian community. So beyond, you know, the standard narrative that we know about his uh, political involvement, his involvement in, uh, you know, economic affairs and, and talking specifically about his uh, activities with regard to the Zoroastrian community. And so based on what responses we get, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to weave that into my presentation. Um, but uh, to begin, at least with my presentation itself, you know, first, you know, again, let me thank Parzor and uh, Dr. Shernaz Kama for the help that uh, they've given me over the past few years uh, while I've been researching and, and writing uh, this book on, on Dadabai Naroji. Um, I think for three times I was affiliated with Parzor uh, through the Fulbright program. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the support I've, I've got from, from them over the years. Uh, Parzo has had its, its own connections with, uh, with Naroji, you know, uh, I think several years ago, they came out with a, uh, a coin that was uh, presented by Jaswan Singh when he was finance minister, uh, a Naroji coin. And I believe they're doing work now also with uh, uh, the Naroji family house in, in Navsari, uh, which will actually feature in one of the slides, which uh, will, will come up soon. So with that, let me get into the, the meat of the presentation. So this, this is the book that I've recently written. Um, now, now, Roji lived a very long life. I mean, he died when he was uh, 91. Um, so, you know, he, when, he, you know when he was born, uh, parts of Western India uh, had just recently come under uh, British control. And when he died, India was, was only a few decades Dinyar, are you there?
Dinyar is just joining us in a second. He just had to uh, re-log in. Hi, Dinya. Yeah, we see you now. Okay. And so uh, yeah, we'll just take it from where we left off. Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, I wonder, might it be better maybe for, for you to share the screen? I mean, if, if, if my internet is causing a problem, maybe that would be better. Yeah, sure. So uh, Mata will just do that. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. So, I, I apologize for that that technical difficulty. I, I know these these are these are obviously an inevitable while uh, you know we're we're doing everything remotely. Um, yeah. So so let's 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 begin again. So um, if I if uh, if I could have the next slide, I don't, I don't think I, I can't control the order, right? I'll have to, I'll just have to tell you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So. Um, as uh, you know, I, I at least I thought I'd mentioned, but you probably hadn't heard me. Naroji had a, a relatively long life. He he lived for ninety one years. Um, his uh, you know he he was born in Bombay and he, and he passed away in in, in Bombay. And the, and the city had changed dramatically in in the intervening ninety one years uh, where he uh, you know had uh, passed his life. If I could, if I could have the next slide, please. So we, we do know a few things about Naroji in the sense that, you know, I mean, the, the standard narrative of Naroji's life, we know that he had written about uh, the poverty of India. Uh, he had elaborated on this idea called the drain theory. Um, if I could have the next slide. And we also know that uh, he had served in the House of Commons as uh, arguably the first Indian to uh, be elected to the, uh, to the British Parliament. There were a few other individuals who uh, had Indian ancestry, uh, but uh, you know he was the first person who actually identified as an Indian when he was uh, in Parliament. Next slide. Good. So in this presentation, I'll uh, take you through uh, his involvement with, with the, 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 the Parsi and larger Zoroastrian community, uh, focusing in three different countries. I mean, the first country, obviously, is, is India. Uh, I'll be talking to you about his connections with the, the Parsi community in, in Bombay. Um, next, we'll talk a little bit about his connections with uh, the, the British Parsi community. And finally, the Iranian Zoroastrian community, something that's a little less known. Uh, so we began appropriately enough in, in Bombay, if I could have the next slide. So now, Roji, his family actually came from the town of Navsari. Um, and Navsari is a, uh, you know, still today an important priestly center in Gujarat. There's, there still are about, say, maybe 3,000, 4,000 Parsis who, uh, who live in the, in, in the city. Um, and Naroji specifically came from a, a priestly lineage. Um, if you look at uh, the tables of his family tree, um, his family could actually trace ancestry uh, back to the, the first Parsi priest who supposedly came to Navsari. Uh, next slide. So this is a family tree that was done in, in the 1920s. And you see uh, Dadabai Naroji, his name circled in, in red. Uh, and uh, you know, everyone is coming from this, this, this individual called uh, Kamdin. And uh, before him, there were, uh, there were other priests in this line. Uh, so this was a, a quite uh, elite uh, priestly family. But by the time that Dadabai Naroji was born, uh, his, his at least branch of the family uh, had fallen on relatively hard times. Uh, his uh, parents and grandparents grew up in relative poverty. Um, and just before he was uh, born, uh, probably in 1824, 1823 or so, uh, his parents moved from uh, Navsari and Dharampur to, to Bombay. Um, and it was in Bombay where he was born. Next slide. Which is interesting because if, if you go to Navsari today, uh, you, you will see a house uh, which is known as the Dadabai Naroji birthplace. And it is uh, inarguably a very old house. Uh, and it probably had some connection with uh, the, the Dordi family. Which was Bombay. Um, and, uh, you know, in his lifetime, there were people who were, who were claiming that he was actually born in Navsari uh, and he would correct them. Uh, 
so, you know, regardless of the fact that he was born in Bombay, this house probably had some important connection with the family. Uh, and luckily, it's it's being uh, preserved. Uh, you know, again, it's it's one of the the, the few very very old Parsi houses that still survive uh, in the city. So, you know, we, at best we can say that that Naroji's lineage comes back from uh, the town of Nasari, and Nasari bequeaths a lot uh, to the the wider Parsi community. I mean, you have the the Tata family, the family of Jamshichi Tiji boy, and countless other important Parsis uh, throughout the centuries have come from uh, this particular city. Next slide. So the place that Naroji was born and grew up in was, as I, I mentioned, in Bombay. And, and specifically, it was in a, a neighborhood known as Kadak, uh, which today is um, located in the general area of Bendi Bazaar. There, there, there still is a street uh, in this part of uh, Bendi Bazaar, Dongri, that is called uh, uh, Kadak. Uh, naturally, his particular house no longer survives. The area has been vastly changed. Uh, but then, like now, it was it was a, you know, a very bustling kind of uh, you know, noisy, crowded place uh, that, you know, nevertheless had a lot of, you know, activity going on, commercial activity, trading activity. And, um, you know, there were Parsis living in this area, but there were also Muslims, Hindus, Jains. Uh, there was a large Jewish community just to the south and just to the north in Baikala. Uh, there were wealthy members of um, the European community, Parsis, uh, uh, Jewish individuals, uh, and, and many others. So Naruji grew up in a very cosmopolitan atmosphere. And uh, I think that really, uh, that particular background gave a very strong impetus to the type of politics and uh, political outlook that he developed throughout his life, which was always kind of based on uh, forces of unity forces of kind of bringing people together rather than you know dividing people by particular backgrounds. And we can trace this right back to his childhood. He grew up in a, in a very cosmopolitan environment. Next slide. At a relatively young age, uh, he received his uh, Navar uh, at uh, the Wadiya Atashbiram. And, and in this sense, he actually was a, a bit of a pioneer. Uh, until this point, um, if uh, you were going through the Navar ceremony, chances are you would have gone back to a place like Navsari or Udwada or many of the old other uh, priestly centers, Surat, Bharuch. Uh, most of the Navars and Martabs were not done in Bombay. Uh, and beginning in the 1830s, you start to have the first ones done uh, at places like the, the Vadiyaji Atishpiram. Uh, so Naroji went through the uh, initiation ceremony for the priesthood uh, when he was uh, in his teenage years. Um, he was slated to become a priest, a full-time priest like his father. Uh, but because his father passed away when he was relatively young, uh, that didn't come to transpire. Uh, and instead, uh, you know, a, a very different trajectory of life uh, was available for him. Next slide. And that involved education. Uh, his mother, uh, his widow, widowed mother, uh, enrolled him at a relatively young age into uh, a school in Bombay that had been set up uh, between uh, the British and many Indian elites. Uh, people uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, again, Parsi merchants, Hindu merchants, Muslim merchants uh, had funded this, uh, this organization which provided free education to uh, poor, deserving, uh, Indian students, and Naroji was one of them, and he was admitted actually into an English language school, which was quite rare in that in that day. Uh, so again, from his youth, he had exposure to um, education from British teachers as well as Indian teachers, and he was taught, uh, you know, modern science, mathematics, philosophy, etc. Uh, so this kind of added to the particular cosmopolitan background that he had. Next slide. And the other feature of his life was that, of course, he got married. Uh, in this era, Parsis, like all other Indians, uh, practiced child marriage. Uh, and so when Naroji was around 10 or 11 years old, he was married off to uh, uh, a girl of about seven years of age, uh, Gulbai Shroff. Uh, and their marriage lasted for about 70 years. Again, you know, this, this was relatively common uh, across the board, uh, regardless of whether uh, you know, a Parsi was, was rich or poor. Uh, child marriage was 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 quite the norm, and it, it only really started to break down uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, the frustrating thing when one researches Naroji is that we know hardly anything about his wife. I mean, even though his wife again was part of his life for 70 years, um, there's hardly any documentary evidence on her. Uh, she was most likely illiterate, uh, so we have no letters from her. The the only information we have about her comes through. Um, you know, passages and other letters, and there's not much that was really talked about her. So it, it, it really is one of the, um, the strange features when you research Naroji's life, that you don't know about this person who was, who was so in, in, integrally uh, important in, in his uh, particular family. Next slide. Now, 
by the time that Nauruji was 16 or 17, again, he was married, he had received this, this form of uh, English language education, and that set him up uh, to receive higher education in Elphinstone College, uh, which was the premier uh, institute for Western education at the time um, in uh, Western India. Uh, it wasn't located in the in the building that you see over here at that time. It was located actually close by to uh, what is today Dobi Talao. Um, and Nauruji was one of several uh, bright Parsis as well as Hindus and Muslims enrolled in the school. Um, next slide, please. And the interesting thing about Elphinstone is that in addition to there being uh, British professors, uh, there were also Indian professors. And, and one of the professors there was actually a Parsi, a, a man called Nauroji Fardunji, uh, who was himself important in terms of uh, the Parsi's political and social advancement in the mid 1900s. Um, and he was one of Dadabai Nauroji's professors. Uh, and another very influential pr uh, professor on Nauroji and his peers was a Maharashtrian man by the name of Bal Gangadhar Shastri Jambekar. Um, and these two individuals, along with several other you know, Irish or, or Scots or, or, or English uh, men, uh, taught Nauroji and imbibed certain intellectual traditions which would stay with him for the rest of his life. Um, ideas on the Enlightenment, um, certain principles of rational thinking, the importance of mathematics, logic. Um, and these, in turn, had an impact on um, Nauroji's uh, political views, social views, and, and religious views as well. Next slide. So after Dadabai Nauroji completed his education in Elphinstone around 1848, 1849, uh, he actually returned to school as a professor. Um, in this era, it was, again, very difficult for an educated individual to get a, um, a proper job. Um, you know, you could work in a, in a mercantile house, you could work for uh, the government, but you wouldn't really put all your skills to use. So it was kind of natural that he gravitated towards, uh, back towards his, his alma mater. Uh, and while he was a professor, uh, he taught um, things like mathematics, he taught astronomy, uh, engineering, um, but he also had, uh, you know, uh, developing in his mind uh, ideas on religious and social reform. Uh, so while he served as a professor at Elphinstone in the late 1840s and 1850s, uh, he began to involve himself more in realms of, say, Parsi religious reform. Uh, if we could have the next slide. He was part of a movement called Young Bombay. Uh, and this was uh, a movement in the 1840s and 1850s that, again, kind of spanned uh, Bombay's uh, ethnic mix. Uh, and at its core was this idea of the need for um, reform, uh, whether it was rationalist reform, whether it was uh, you know, Im imparting certain enlightenment ideas in religious practice, simplifying religious practice, adopting certain reforms that were anti-Orthodox. Uh, and so Naruji helped lead the charge, at least in the Parsi community, and there were others who did the same, say, amongst Hindus and, and Muslims. Uh, but this was a reform movement that had three very distinct uh, characteristics that were all linked. I mean, there were social aspects, religious aspects, and political aspects, uh, and they all kind of intermixed with one another in, in interesting ways. Uh, so if you could have the next slide, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how, um, you know, particularly with the Parsi community, this manifested itself. In the 1840s and 1850s, uh, Parsis, as well as any other community in India, um, suffered tremendously in terms of uh, the lack of opportunities for education for, for women or girls. Um, we nowadays think of the Parsi community as being relatively enlightened and advanced, um, especially when it comes to education. Uh, well, we, we were as backward pretty much as anyone else uh, 160, 170, 80 years ago. Um, and Naroti was one of the first um, individuals in the Parsi community to really kind of advocate uh, mass education for, for women. Um, and at this stage, uh, efforts were relatively tentative. Uh, you know, he was able to start along with a, a few of his friends at Elvinston, a network of schools where three different systems of schools were set up uh, a, a network of schools for Hindus, a network of schools for uh, sorry, Hindu Gujaratis, Hindu Maharashtrians, and a network of school for, for Parsis. And eventually there was a, another system set up for, for Muslims as well. Um, and he and his uh, Elphinstone colleagues would go around parts of Bombay and uh, ask parents to uh, enroll their daughters in these schools. And most of the time, the responses they'd get were quite negative. You know, how dare you, uh, you know, you ask for my daughter to be educated. This is considered, you know, against our religion, against our principles. Um, but he persevered, and uh, within the span of of, of several years, uh, the number of girls enrolled in these schools went up from 
a few dozen to a few hundred. So that by the year 1855, when uh, these girls' schools had been in operation for about maybe six or seven years, uh, enrollments in Bombay were around the order of 500 and 600, which was quite significant. And, and this was an effort that was entirely done by Indians. I mean, uh, British uh, support was at its best moral. Uh, there was really no financial support given. Uh, a few well-meaning professors in Elphinstone helped Nairoji and his friends. Uh, but by and large, the British government did nothing really to, to support this effort. So this was really kind of like an uh, internal community effort to, to kind of change the dynamics of how education uh, was, uh, you know, available to people uh, within the Piracy community. Next slide. So that was one particular aspect of Nauruji's activities when it came to uh, uh, religious and social reform. Uh, the other activity that he participated in was uh, journalism. Uh, and this was something, again, that was a, a common avenue for reform uh, in this era. Um, if you wanted to set up uh, some sort of reformist organization or even an anti-reformist organization, you would set up uh, most of the time uh, a newspaper. And so, you know, today, of course, you'd, you'd rely on the internet or you'd send out mass emails. Back then, you'd come up with a, a cheap uh, periodical that would be distributed as far as you could to your friends and your relatives. Um, and this is what Naruji does in 1851. Uh, he helps set up a paper called Rask Kuftar, Persian for truth teller, uh, along with a few of his friends, including uh, Naruji Fardunji, his old professor at Elphinstone. Um, and this uh, paper is reformist in its scope. Uh, it advocates uh, certain religious reforms. It, it goes against orthodox practice, superstitions. Uh, it advocates the spread of education. Uh, and it also criticizes the BPP, the Bombay Parsi Panchayat. You know, the tradition of Parsis railing against the, uh, the Bombay Parsi Panchayat is very old. It's not a recent thing. Um, and uh, Raskofta was one of the organs that really kind of drove against uh, uh, kind of the, the, the hegemony of, of orthodox uh, men who are known as uh, Shethias or Shethias, who are important uh, commercial figures in this era, uh, who had kind of like a stranglehold on this organization. Uh, so again, at a very young age, now Roji was in his late 20s and, and early 30s when he helped uh, run Ras Kuftar. He's taking a very reformist uh, uh, standpoint uh, in terms of all aspects of community affairs. Next slide. In terms of specific religious reform, um, he helped set up an organization called the, the Renome Mazda Yasnan Sabha, which, which still sort of exists today, more or less on paper. Uh, but it was a reformist organ uh, that, again, advocated for the adoption of certain rationalist principles and uh, the um, you know, doing away of certain practices that were not considered uh, authentically Parsi or Zoroastrian. Uh, so to give you an example, in, in, in the 1850s, uh, many Parsis patronized Hindu temples or, or Muslim dargahs, or they would participate in, uh, you know, uh, Tazia during uh, Muharram, uh, or they'd practice certain types of black magic or adhere to certain types of superstitious, superstitious practices. Uh, and these were all practices which members of uh, the Sabha uh, wanted to get rid of. They didn't think it was authentic. Uh, so in its proceedings, they, again, kind of advocated a, a reformist, simplified uh, a form of, of, of Parsi religious practice, which, you know, unknowingly kind of borrowed from a lot of the rationalist principles that were imbibed from Elphinstone. Uh, so, you know, there, there was a certain, you know, a lot of uh, scholars and, hist and historians have talked about, whereas, you know, reformers in the Parsi community in this era kind of got rid of a lot of syncretic practice where Parsi is borrowed from, uh, say, Muslims or Hindus, uh, they actually, you know, the reformist type of creed that was adopted actually borrowed a lot from, say, Protestant uh, Christian thought. So it wasn't necessarily going back to something more authentic. Uh, it was supplementing some uh, some type of religious influences, uh, whether they be Hindu or Muslim, with religious influences from another faith, uh, namely modern Christianity. Next slide. And the, the other activity that really kind of went to the heart of, say, gender dynamics and, and the idea of the community needed to be more modern uh, had to do with food, actually. I mean, uh, Pisces, as we all know, we, we all love our food. Uh, but the whole practice of eating, again, 170, 180 years ago, uh, was radically different from what we have today. I mean, first of all, a lot of Pisces would practice habits like not speaking, uh, while eating. And, you know, that might be news today for any raucous wedding where, you know, we have lots of people eating during uh, food. Uh, but the other practice that was very common was uh, separation of men and women eating. Uh, normally, uh, the women would, of course, be cooking the food and they'd serve the men uh, and the women would not eat the food until the men had finished. So there had been, the, the, you know, there was a gender separation in terms of eating. Um, and Naroji and 
a few of his reform-minded colleagues, men, men like Manakji Karshidji, who helped set up uh, one important uh, uh, female educational institute, the Alexandra Native Girls Institute, uh, helped support uh, in what was called an interdining movement uh, in this era, where uh, both men and women would sit together and eat together, uh, and support, you know, hopefully, probably also equally participate in uh, the tasks of, you know, uh, setting food, serving food, and maybe even even making food. Uh, so these were all quite radical ideas for their time. Uh, again, you know. Well through the, the early 20th century, there were many Parsis who would not eat food that was not cooked by uh, Parsi chefs. So when the first Parsis go off to places like, you know, Calcutta or London or Hong Kong, uh, they would take with them Parsi servants to cook their food. They would not eat uh, what, you know, local Singaporeans or Londoners would provide in a restaurant or, uh, you know, what they pr provide through, you know, working as a chef. Uh, and these practices slowly started to break down due to activities like interdining. Uh, so if you could have the next slide. So Dadabai Naruti eventually leaves Bombay in the year 1855, and he spends much of the next five uh, decades uh, going between Bombay and London. Uh, you know, many of those years are spent in London, and occasionally goes back to Bombay for family reasons and uh, small stints where he works in, in you know, uh, say, Baroda as the prime minister, or he joins the Bombay Municipal Corporation. Uh, but this, you know, early era of Naroji's career, uh, and again, Naroji leaves Bombay when he's only 30, um, really solidified Naroji's reputation as a religious and, and social reformer. Uh, so much so that, you know, when um, newspapers or magazines or books came out much later, in the early 20th century, when Naroji was identified, uh, such as in this particular uh, book, uh, you know, in, in English, he might be identified as a political, uh, uh, you know, nationalist or leader. But if you look at the Gujarati reading over here, uh, he's being uh, identified as uh, someone who's uh, involved in female education uh, and someone who's involved in, in social reform. Uh, so at least within the vernacular Gujarati, Parsi Gujarati tradition, uh, his identification with religious and social reform uh, re remained very strong and in many cases almost paramount. Next slide. So as I said, for the for the uh, remaining five decades of his active uh, uh, political career, he went uh, between Bombay and London. Uh, next slide. And in the late 1850s and early 1860s, Naruti was quite a unique individual. He was he was one of the few Indians living in London uh, or Liverpool at this time, uh, and he was one of the the handful of Parsis there. I mean, we, we do know of many Parsis who had been to. Uh, London and Liverpool and elsewhere in Great Britain before Naroji, uh, but you know they would stay for three or four years and then go back to Bombay or, or, or wherever you know they might have lived in Gujarat. Uh, Naroji was part of a generation which which now lived and worked for a much more long term uh, horizon. Uh, so since he was living and working in in, in Great Britain for much for a much longer term, um, and since he was coming into contact with more British people, um, he naturally would feel the need to explain himself, what his particular cultural and religious background was like. Uh, so in, in the year um, 1861, he actually delivers uh, two talks uh, in Liverpool, where he was living at this time, uh, on the Parsi religion, where he introduces what the Parsi religion was about, you know, what Zoroastrianism was about, what Parsi practice was about, uh, to a primarily British um, you know, white audience. Um, and these talks, which were eventually published, uh, uh, circulated throughout Great Britain uh, and as far afield as continental Europe and in North America. Uh, and they became really the first um, English language uh, texts uh, which explained what Zoroastrianism was and what it meant to be a, a, a religious Parsi from the perspective of a, of a practicing Parsi Zoroastrian. And again, these talks were so popular that actually many decades later, um, in the year 1888, uh, Naroji gave an updated version of this talk. And, and that talk, in its sense, was also serialized and uh, distributed around the world. Uh, so you know, Naroji had established his, his credentials as an important Parsi figure in Bombay. Uh, now he was doing this uh, in Great Britain as well. Um, and this had an immediate knockoff effect. Uh, Naroji immediately started to uh, get in, in contact with many other religious scholars in Great Britain, uh, people who were studying religions in India, Persia, and, other, and elsewhere in Asia. Uh, and you start to see kind of like a, a mutual conversation going uh, about people uh, who um, you know, want to study more about Zoroastrianism and learn more about the Parsi community. Next slide. 
Now, the other activity that Naroji begins in the same year that he delivers these talks uh, was establishing some, some sort of infrastructure uh, for the diaspora community. Now, whenever Parsis went and settled in a new place, whether that was Bombay or whether it was Calcutta, Singapore, Rangoon, or in this case, London, um, one of the first things they were focused on uh, was establishing uh, infrastructure uh, in, in the case of deaths. So funerary infrastructure, uh, ways to allow for um, death rites to be uh, done properly. And, and this, this might seem rather macabre to us today, uh, but it actually is something that still is being practiced elsewhere in the diaspora. I mean, wh where, wherever diaspora communities are being formed, uh, whether it is in the United States or Australia, Canada, wherever, uh, one of the first things that's that usually is done is, you know, provisions to be made for, say, a cemetery or, uh, you know, a separate burial ground. Um, and this, again, has to do with our unique uh, traditions for, uh, you know, conducting death ceremonies. Uh, and this is what took place um, in Great Britain uh, as well. Uh, uh, so in the... Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Uh, so um, in the 1860s, there was a very concerted effort to uh, set up a separate uh, Zoroastrian cemetery in London, which still uh, exists to, the, uh, to this day. Uh, you can go and, and visit it. Um, and this was kind of the main thrust of what of an organization uh, which was known at this time as the Zoroastrian Fund, uh, which eventually becomes the, the modern day ZTFE, the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe. Um, and for a good 40 years or so, uh, Naroji was involved with this organization, uh, first as a secretary uh, and eventually as the president of the organization. So he actually serves as president until around 1906, 1907. Uh, so he's really the guiding force for this, this main organization bringing together Pisces uh, in Great Britain. Uh, and again, in this area, there are not many of them. There, there are probably 50 or 60 uh, in the entire country. So it's, it's, there's not a, a, a good body of work to be done, but occasionally things would happen. Uh, so if, if we could have the next slide. So the most common, um, you know, thing uh, to occur when we look at the records of, of the early ZTFE is, you know, what happens after a member of the Zoroastrian community passes away. Uh, so here you see on the screen, a, you know, a, a, an example, you know, a, a, an announcement that's given to the community uh, by an individual called Nasharwanji Mullah, uh, who announces that uh, a Parsi had uh, passed away and uh, particular provisions were, were being made for a ceremony to take place at the, at, uh, uh, the cemetery, which, which the Parsis had established in this place called Brookwood. Uh, a special train was booked from central London in order to go to the, uh, to the cemetery for the ceremony. And that, by and large, was pretty much all that the organization did, other than, say, promote things like uh, Navro's uh, dinners or occasional social interactions. Uh, so that's so by the early 20th century, where, where more, when more Pisces are coming and settling in London, uh, there was de a demand for more robust infrastructural um, development. Uh, so if you could have the next slide. And this is what happened. Uh, more and more Pisces demanded uh, that, you know, other organizations be set up in order to promote, say, uh, community dinners or, you know, get togethers. So, you know, in, in um, 1905, 1906, uh, a separate organization was set up uh, called um, uh, the, uh, the Pisces the Club. Uh, and this particular organization uh, specifically was meant uh, to, to hold dinners uh, at, say, London restaurants, uh, to promote social interaction. And, and again, Naroji was involved in this organization. And I'm not sure how long it lasted for, but we, but we do definitely know that it, it held a few uh, events. And actually, the menu for this particular din dinner that you see advertised on the screen uh, still survives. So you can actually see what they ate. and. Uh, you know, how many people attended. Uh, so these were all signs of a, of a growing community uh, taking place in London and also farther afield. Next slide. So this was another interesting find that, uh, that I found in the archives. Um, beginning again in the early 20th century, Pisces in other parts of Great Britain uh, start to set up their own organizations. Uh, so in Edinburgh, there were a group of Pisces students who had gone there to study at the university. Uh, Edin Edinburgh University at this time was... Uh, um, quite well known for medical training. And so you had a number of very prominent Pisces doctors going to there for medical training. And which time they established uh, uh, their own Pisces institution. Um, and the man who organized uh, this uh, uh, association, the, the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Pisces Union, uh, would communicate with Naroji again for support and help uh, and try to get Naroji to come and attend uh, events. 
um, the, the union actually tried to um, purchase a house as its quarters, uh, and it actually would hold uh, lectures and events throughout the year. So it eventually probably had a relatively sizable number of uh, participants, um, not necessarily all Pisces. I mean, other Indians would be participating in events, uh, but the core nucleus of the group would be uh, Pisces who would be living in, in, uh, in Edinburgh at this time. So what I'm trying to show over here is that by the early 20th century, uh, the community in Great Britain had grown in size and diversity so that it actually now had three different associations uh, you know, for maybe 100, 150 people. Um, in addition, there was also a newspaper, uh, a paper called the Parsi Chronicle, uh, which was run out of a, a town called Ilford close by to, to, to London in, in the very early 20th century. Uh, so the community was relatively dynamic in, in this quite early era. Uh, and Narochi played a role in usually in the capacity of being, say, the president of the organization or someone who would you know, kind of look after new arrivals and make sure that uh, you know, they landed with their two feet in a different country and were able to start their education or professional activities uh, without any major cultural adjustments. Next slide. So as I mentioned when I talked about the, the, the talks that Naroji gave uh, in the year 1861 on uh, Zoroastrianism, when Naroji arrived in Great Britain, he was one of the few people who could really talk about Zoroastrianism from a, a standpoint of scholarly authority. Um, and in time, he evolves into kind of like a, you know, a scholarly middleman, if you will, uh, between important European Orientalists in Europe and Great Britain uh, and Parsi priests and Parsi scholars in Bombay. So if, you know, an important um, scholar like, say, Max Muller had a question that he wanted to ask a member of, uh, you know, the Parsi community in, in Bombay, such as the scholar Jivanji Jamshiji Modi, uh, he'd probably ask Dadabai Naroji for help to get in touch with uh, Modi. Uh, similarly, if, um, you know, someone like Lawrence Mills, who was a, a scholar of Avastan, wanted financial support from the Bombay Parsi Panchayat, uh, he would actually ask Naroji to help facilitate this. So not only was Naroji producing his own scholarship on Zoroastrianism, uh, he was also helping many other important scholars um, carry out their own scholarship. So again, you know, if uh, a person like James Dumpster, who was an important French linguist and, uh, and uh, philologist, uh, wanted translations of Gujarati literature, Naroji provided it to him. Uh, so he played kind of a behind the scenes role in a lot of kind of the emerging scholarship on Zoroastrianism uh, in the late 19th century. Next slide. So Naroji increasingly was recognized as a religious authority uh, in his own right. Uh, so much so that when the World's Parliament of Religions took place in the year 1893 in Chicago, uh, and this is the event where Swami Vivekananda goes and gives you know, a very rousing talk that's still you know, considered to be quite famous, uh, Naroji was actually invited to participate in this event as well. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, th the people who were organizing this event in Chicago sent several uh, letters to Naroji imploring him to attend. Um, unfortunately, he could not attend because at this time he was serving in parliament. And as he mentioned to uh, the organizers of this, uh, this particular conference, uh, he couldn't get away from his parliamentary duties. But, you know, he was recognized as enough of an authority that he was invited to this major conclave of uh, religious scholars and, uh, and people taking place in Chicago in this era. Next slide. So just to conclude for, with this particular aspect of my talk, uh, whenever Naruji came back to Bombay, such as in 1893, after he had been elected uh, um, president of the, of the Indian National Congress for its Lahore session, and after he had um, you know, served in, in the British Parliament for, for a year or so, uh, he was identified as an Indian leader, but he was also identified um, as a specifically Parsi leader in the sense that you know, when he was greeted uh, in Bombay upon his return, Parsi priests would, uh, you know, come and meet him or he was taken to a Parsi temple, but he was also, um, you know, acknowledged by religious leaders of other communities. Uh, so, you know, again, to give you another example, when Naruji is, is kind of taken through town in celebration when he, after he arrives in Bombay in 1893, uh, his, you know, convoy is specifically stopped uh, in front of Hindu temples or, uh, you know, one uh, Muslim organization, um, in order to kind of show that, you know, this particular individual is, is not just being identified as, say, a Parsi, but also being identified as someone uh, who has the trust and support of, of members of other religious communities. Next slide. So the, the final part of my talk has to do with uh, Naroji's involvement with the Iranian Zoroastrian community. 
Uh, now, the Iranian Zoroastrians, we, we can actually go ahead to the next, next slide now. The Iranian Zoroastrian community um, by the 1850s, as, as many of you know, uh, had become extremely poor. Uh, it had, uh, you know, suffered from, from centuries of, of persecution, uh, out-migration to places like India, uh, forced conversions in some cases, uh, so much so that, you know, by, the, by 1854, 1855, when, you know, the first efforts are, are made to kind of calculate how many Zoroastrians are left um, in Iran, the number's anywhere on the order of 6,000 to 8,000 people. Uh, which got a lot of Parsis thinking about how they could help uh, stem this decline and, and reverse the socioeconomic fortunes of uh, fortunes of the community. Uh, so much so that in the 1850s, uh, societies are begun uh, to help channel Parsi wealth and uh, Parsi support towards educating the Iranian Zoroastrians, uh, to giving them uh, professional training that would hope, hopefully kind of stem this process of uh, marginalization in Iran. Uh, Naruti was part of uh, one of these organizations, uh, the one that you see on the screen, this uh, Society for the Amelioration of uh, the Iranian Zoroastrians. Um, and here he joined along with other individuals, such as um, you know the, the Pitits, uh, Jamchichi Jiji boy, uh, and eventually people like Manichi Limji Hataria, uh, who was considered the first Parsi agent to go out to uh, Iran and really kind of help the community. Uh, it seemed that Manichi and Naroji were in touch with, with one another. I, I found snippets of uh, letters in Naroji's papers that hint at correspondence. The actual correspondence is not there. Um, but it looks like the two were in touch with one another. Um, and Naroji played a, a very particular role uh, in Parsi efforts to, to help the Iranian Zoroastrians. Next slide. So whereas wealthy people in Bombay would, would try to raise money uh, in order to help set up schools uh, in places like Yazd and Kerman, where the Iranian Zoroastrian community lived, uh, Naroji, as a politically important person with connections in London, uh, tried to reach out to the Iranian government uh, in order to convince, say, the Shah of Iran uh, or other important individuals, such as the, the Persian ambassador in London, uh, to, stamp uh, you know, to stamp out and, and clamp down on uh, you know, persecution against the Zoroastrians and, and allow uh, certain uh, methods of extracting wealth from them, like the jizya tax, which is a tax placed on non-Muslims, uh, to be eradicated. So Naroji's task was essentially to try to reach out to people of power uh, who might have connections through London uh, and therefore try to get the government of Iran to you know, alleviate uh, the conditions of the Iranian Zoroastrians. Um, and Naroji's opportunity came in the year 1873. Uh, in that year, the Shah of Iran, uh, a man called Nasr al-Din Shah Qajar, who was a, a member of the Qajar dynasty, uh, came to visit Europe and specifically came to London uh, on a state visit. Uh, and Naroji and Naroji Fardunji, who also was in London at this time, networked furiously in order to try to meet the Shah. Uh, and their, their goal was to meet the Shah, present a memorial, uh, talk about the need to, to help the Iranian Zoroastrians, and also mention that the Parsis of Bombay uh, were very keen that uh, he do something to kind of reverse the, uh, you know, the, the, their process of, uh, of, of marginalization. Uh, and so Naruji reached out again to his friends who were scholars, who might know people in the Iranian government. Uh, he reached out to a man called Malcolm Khan, who was the Iranian uh, ambassador in London. Um, and the result was um, in 1873, Naroji and Naroji Fardunji actually met with the Shah. Uh, very briefly uh, in, I believe, Buckingham Palace and presented this memorial. Uh, and this kind of helped the ball uh, to start rolling uh, in terms of getting the Iranian government to take the, the, the interests of the Iranian Zoroastrians more seriously. Uh, within a few years, uh, the Shah revoked uh, the Jizya tax, uh, essentially got rid of the tax that uh, was meant to kind of, uh, you know, um, tax people who are not... Um, uh, Muslims, at least for the Zoroastrian community, that tax was lifted. Uh, and from that point, you'd start to see the Iranian government uh, take a much more kind of uh, positive line, not just towards the Iranian Zoroastrian community, but also the Parsi community as well. Uh, you start to see Iranian representatives in Bombay, like the Iranian consul, really reach out to the Parsi community and try to establish better relations. So there's, there's a very strong change of attitude that takes place uh, at this moment. Next slide. And so, you know, again, this, this kind of diagrams, you know, the networks that, that Naroji and Naroji Fardunji used, uh, you see them at the top uh, left corner. Uh, they would use scholars. Uh, you see two scholars, uh, you know, pictures over here. Uh, one, a Sanskritist um, uh, called uh, Davies, another um, 
um, an Iranian scholar who had a distinct, who was wearing a distinctive Fez hat over here called Edmund Brown. Uh, these individuals knew the Persian ambassador, Malcolm Khan, uh, and through Malcolm Khan, Naruji and Naruji Fardunji were able to get in touch with uh, the Shah, who you see at the, uh, the lower uh, left-hand corner over here. Next slide. And, and so, um, yes, one, one good. Um, so the affairs of the Iranian Zoroastrian community now start to get um, embodied in uh, the activities of other associations like the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe. Uh, so this is, a, a, you know, actually a, a kind of a, a letter that was presented to uh, an Iranian official, the, the prime minister of Iran at this time, uh, and it was done so by the Zoroastrian Trust Funds. Uh, and again, this was meant to kind of curry diplomatic favor and kind of uh, improve ties between the Parsi community and the Iranian, Zoroast uh, the Iranian Zoroastrians and the Iranian government to kind of, you know, facilitate uh, better relations. Uh, so you start to see... Iranian officials being hosted by people like Naroji or Manchiji Bhavnagri whenever they come to visit London. Uh, correspondence is, is, is started between important Parsis and uh, important Iranian Muslim individuals, uh, and this develops throughout the 20th century. Next slide. And at the same time, members of the Iranian Zoroastrian community reach out to people like Dadabai Naroji or other important Parsis uh, who are involved in this effort. So, you know, this is, this is a letter uh, written by the uh, Zoroastrian Anjuman and Yaz, uh, which again was thanking Naroji and his colleagues for uh, help in, in uh, presenting another um, memorial to uh, the Shah of Iran in, I think, the year 1901. Uh, an, another memorial that was presented to, to the Shah actually in, in, in Belgium uh, by Manchaji Bhavnagri and Dadabai Naroji. Next slide. And so this hint, hints all at, at a much more you know, colorful, deep relationship that existed between, say, Parsis, uh, Iranians, Zoroastrians, and you know, people who they interacted with, both in India uh, as well as in places like uh, Great Britain, where increasingly a lot more Parsis were settling. Uh, this was actually one of the most interesting letters I found in the Naroji papers. It's, it's a letter in Gujarati, and it's, it's written by a man called Arishir Reporter, who some of you may recognize. Uh, uh, he was uh, a successor to Manakji Limji Hataria uh, as an agent for the Parsis in Iran. Uh, he was basically tasked uh, with helping the Iranian Zoroastrian community, setting up schools, uh, religious foundations, um, and taking, say, Parsi financial support and channeling that toward, uh, you know, education and social uplift. Um, and in the year 1898, he writes this letter uh, to Dadabai Naroji, and he actually tells uh, Naroji that, look, I've been in Iran for uh, the past several years. Uh, I've been doing social reform activities, both with Iranian uh, Zoroastrian women and Iranian Muslim women. Uh, so here you see that tradition of kind of women's uplift continue. Um, uh, in another individual, in, in, uh, in Arisha Reporter's capacity. Uh, and he actually asked Naroji for help to get in touch with important British feminists, uh, people, uh, you know, in Britain who at the time were, were campaigning for women's education or even the right for women to vote. And he tried to get him to ask these particular British feminists uh, to, to take an interest in Iranian women's um, uplift and Iranian women's social reform activities. So here you start to see this very intricate relationship develop where, you know, a Parsi in Iran can foresee, uh, you know, a British woman involved in, say, the campaign for British women to get the right to vote, uh, involved in Iranian uh, women's activities. And this, again, shows how globalized in some way uh, the world was uh, in the early 20th century and how Parsis like Naroji other people like Ardashir Reporter, Naroji Fardunji, and others uh, participate in kind of these early global networks. Uh, so that is it for my presentation. Uh, for the remainder of our time, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. So now we've got a few questions. Um, would you uh, be able to talk a bit about the relationship between Dadabhai Naoroji and Madam Kama? Yeah, um, there's not too much that we know. Um, I mean, there are only a few letters between the two individuals. Um, basically, Madam Kama comes to Europe, um, you know, off and on uh, from the 1890s onward. Um, she lives in Paris uh, and occasionally she comes through to London. I mean, her, her estranged husband at this time uh, would spend some time in London as well. Um, 
she had uh, you know extended family members living in in, in North Kensington in, in London um, and so um, Madam Kama came to know Dadabai Naroji first socially um, in fact Dadabai Naroji's granddaughter uh, Perrin Naroji uh, studied in the Sorbonne in Paris uh, and Madam Kama was actually the person who looked look, looked out after her who was kind of her guardian figure uh, but over time, by the year 1905-1906, uh, Madam Kama starts to get more involved in political activities, uh, and, that, and those included activities that Naroji was a part of. Uh, so in the year 1906, for example, Naroji ran, uh, stood for uh, election to parliament. He lost, um, uh, but Madam Kama actually volunteered to help kind of see if, uh, you know, another seat was available for uh, Naroji to help, you know, stand for. Uh, and be elected uh, to parliament. Um, and it's really, you know, only after 1906, 1907, after uh, Dathabai Noroji has retired from political life, uh, that you see Madame Kama become very radical and revolutionary. So, you know, Dathabai Noroji's granddaughter was a part of that process. Naroji himself, he was only there at the very beginning. Thank you. And um, sure. you, you started your presentation asking about the lesser known uh, facets of his personality. And as I was telling you, while doing some research, I, uh, in fact, this was yesterday, I came across the fact that he, it was Dalabai Noroji in 1851 who started the Elphinstone Dramatics Society, uh, Parsi Dramatic Society. And that was so interesting. Could you talk a bit more about the young Bombay uh, reforms and his association with the theatre? So there's not too much I know about his association with theater. I mean, I I know that, you know, one of the the, the first examples of uh, what was what became known as as Parsi theater was a staging of uh, a play on on the story of Rustam and Sora in the year 1851, um, and Naroji was was a part of that production. So there there was a, a Parsi dramatic society that was set up uh, to help stage this uh, uh, this particular um, you know show, uh, but. For the remainder of his life, Naroji took part kind of peripherally in, in related activities. There, there was a, a music appreciation society that uh, uh, was established in Bombay in, I think, the 1860s or 18, the 1870s. And uh, Naroji was a member of this organization and, and, an, and an honorary uh, president as well. Uh, and even again in his in his very early life, um, you know, when he was a student, uh, he would participate in dramatic performances, say, at his, his school in Bombay. So well, we. We do know there was a much longer relationship that he had with theater, but again, a lot of the sources on that aspect of his life don't exist anymore. Maybe another book for you. I mean, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Sources. Um, so, Dr. Nilofar Shroff wants to ask, how did you choose Dada Bhai Naroji as the focus of your research? I mean, it. it I think it evolved in stages. I mean, the, this this grew out of my PhD dissertation and mm -hmm. you know at least when you, when you go into a phd program in the us you, you spend about two years um doing general coursework and you're supposed to use that time in order to develop an idea of what you want to uh, do for your dissertation so you know I, I came into my program knowing that i wanted to do something with Parsi history and also something with uh regard to the history of indian nationalism um and naroji was in, in many cases uh, a perfect fit um you know a, a good proper book had not been done on him for you know, nearly 70, 80 years. Uh, there were a lot of sources that were untapped in places like Delhi or London. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was again, kind of a natural fit and, and not a lot of people were writing things like biographies. Um, and I thought that it was necessary to write, you know, a biography of, you know, not necessarily just him, but, you know, other individuals as well who played important political and social roles in Indian history. Uh, on that note, Farooq Dijina, who really enjoyed the session, is asking when is your next book coming out uh, and what is the topic? Not for some time. I mean, the the, the next book that I'm 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 working on, and of course, the pandemic has you know thrown its 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 own axle into wheel as as it has for all of us. Uh, is looking at early Indian nationalism in general. Um, so again, not just from the perspective of of one person, uh, but looking at how some of the ideas formed in early Indian nationalism, whether they be political, economic, uh, ideas of social reform, uh, and again, looking at some individuals who, you know, have uh, received less attention, you know, the, people like, say, Lal Mohan Ghosh, who's actually the first Indian to uh, stand for the, for the British Parliament in the year 1885, Alan Octavian Hume, who was the founder of the, the Indian Na National Congress, uh, as well as some other Pisces, Feroz Shah Mehta, Dinshah Bacha, and such. 
Thank you. Um, I wish we had more politicians like Dada Bhai Noroji today, but uh, given his very cosmopolitan uh, sort of uh, outlook, as far as everything uh, is concerned in society, how is there any documentation of his responses to him being called uh, the black man by Lord, was it Lord Salisbury? And uh, yeah. any other such racist incidents that he may have faced? Yeah, I mean, in, in this particular time, I mean, most of the racism that he faced was, was, was you know, given by British individuals. Um, so, you know, the example that that uh, that you're, you're, that uh, Kritika is talking about over here is in the year 1888. The the, the British Prime Minister Lord Sal Salisbury uh, basically says Dada Bhai Naroji is a black man. He should not be elected uh, because you know he's he's not English. He doesn't deserve uh, the vote of an Englishman. Um, and you know the, the interesting thing about that incident is that it actually sparked a lot of backlash by by British people. I mean, a lot of people supported him and said, you know, yes, you know, you know, only English people should should stand for or receive English votes. Uh, but a lot of British individuals also said, no, this is wrong. This is racist. Um, and you know, again, obviously, the strongest response was in a in a place like India. Uh, so you know, a, a lot of the um, the uh, you know ideas against kind of like racial or religious religious discrimination weren't taking place in India. Uh, you know, if anything, what you see in letters is people from all different faiths saying, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are. You know, as long as your political creed is good. Um, you see more of kind of more of a communal line or more of a racist line coming from from British people uh, in this era. So it kind of shows you how things have changed and how history has developed over the past 120 years. Absolutely. Um, Rup is asking, where did you access the archival issues of Rasko Uftar? Yeah. So Rasko Uftar, uh, the newspaper, unfortunately, the, the very, very first editions seem to be lost. Uh, you know, apparently Bombay University had um, copies and apparently in the 1980s they loaned them out in order to get photographed and surprise, surprise, they were never returned. Um, the most extensive collection seems to be at the JN Pitit Library uh, in, in Fort in Bombay. So from, I think from 1854 through, you know, the very early 1900s. Um, so that's the best place to go to. Uh, there are editions here and there in other places, but you know the place you should start off with is Jian Pitit. Thank you, uh, Kaizad Adhijania says thank you for a lovely presentation, and uh, he's asking if there are any girls' schools uh, that Dada Bhai and Aroji was associated with or launched that are still around and operational. Yeah, so the network of girls' schools that that he and his uh, associates support, uh, funded and supported in the 1840s and 1850s. Those passed on, uh, you know. Th those were, were were quite, you know, frugal, small scale efforts, and those were, were replaced by, you know, some of the more permanent schools that we have today. Uh, one school that that still survives that he was involved in uh, was um, the Alexandra Native, uh, you know, Native Girls Institution. Uh, Naroji's friend Manakchi Kashiji was involved in that, and Naroji helped uh, collect funds actually uh, for the school while he was in London. Uh, so there was a connection to that, um, you know. The, I've I've heard from other people of other connections to say Paisi schools in Bombay or or even other schools elsewhere in uh, Gujarat. So there are certain connections here or there, but you know, probably the best connection is through Alexandra. Okay, thank you. Um, Farzi Navari says thank you for sharing. This was very interesting. I've always said that our community does a decent job of supporting women, but we still have ways to uh, get to equality. How do you think we can continue this legacy? Also, what is a good place to research Parsi family lineage? Well, it you know I'll I'll go at least with the with the the, the, the second question first. I mean, it you know obviously the first place to go to is your family. Make sure that your family doesn't throw away old documents, old letters. Uh, far too many people in this community uh, do that, unfortunately. If you don't want to keep them, please give them to Parzor. Exactly. Please, please do give them, give it to them. They'll be more than happy to take it. Um, if you come from a priestly background, uh, there are these uh, tables um, of family trees that do survive. Uh, some of them were published in the 20th century, and some of them still do survive in manuscript form in places like Navsari and Udwada. Uh, and you can at least trace things on the male side. I, I mean, again, prior to the 1850s, 
uh, you know, when, when, when we think about things like women's education or women's equality, uh, Pisces were as bad as, as everyone else. So, you know, that, that comes out through things like these, these family trees. You know, we have very little documentation of the, of the women in these families, uh, but we do know the men. Um, in terms of, you know, what can be done in terms of, you know, furthering gender support, I mean, obviously that's, that needs to be done on, I think, an, an individual level. And um, I think things will evolve as, you know, as circumstances in the community change and certain mindsets change with them. Fingers crossed. Um, Sundari uh, Subramaniam asks if uh, Dadabai retired due to old age or for some other reason. It was, yeah, it was pretty much old age. So he retired in the year 1907 um, when he was 81. Uh, so, you know, he actually was still trying to get into parliament in the year, in the year 1907, uh, and his health just completely broke down. I mean, he, he went to uh, India on a trip from Great Britain, uh, went there, went to, you know, went to Bombay, went to Calcutta and came back to London in the span of a month. Uh, and that was kind of the last straw uh, in terms of his health. And so he suffered... Uh, you know, terrible health when he came back to London. And his, his doctors basically said, if, if you don't retire and you don't go back to India, you'll, you'll die. Um, and so he retired. He lived another 10, 11 years. Um, and his retirement was, was relatively quiet, but every once in a while he'd pop up again and start to do some political activities, which would uh, send his family into a bit of a, a you know, a state of frenzy uh, because they obviously wanted him to kind of, you know, retire from public life. Uh, I'll take the last two questions now. Heta Pandit is asking, would uh, non-Parsis be invited to Parsi weddings in his time? And if yes, did they dine together? That's a very good question. Um, you know, I mean, traditional weddings, I imagine, you know, you know, orthodoxy is a funny thing. I mean, oftentimes orthodoxy is practiced by those who are only who are wealthy enough to, to do so. Um, and so it would not be pra practical for, say, um, you know, certain bars against say non Pisces to be to be done, you know, whether it was in terms of getting food or attending weddings by an average person in a place like Navsari or, or even Bombay in the Sarah. Uh, so I imagine there must have been the presence of, of non Pisces in weddings. Uh, and they certainly were, I mean, it, it became increasingly acceptable by uh, the early 20th century amongst elite Pisces as well. Once you had uh, a group of Indians, <clears throat> you know, in places like Bombay who had uh, strong commercial and social ties outside of the community. So, you know, if <clears throat> if members of, say, the, the Pitted family or the, the, you know, the Tata family were, were having a family wedding, uh, then obviously, say, British people would be invited, prominent Muslim, Christian, um, Hindu merchants would be invited for these weddings also. Uh, what happens in between is, is a bit more of a question mark, and I, I don't really know. Okay. Um, the last question, Ratan Poswala is asking, what was on the menu at the Parsi club dinner? Hi, Ratan. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, you know, I have it somewhere. I, I think I remember something. I mean, you know, as all menus in this era were, um, it was written in French. You know, it's kind of ironic. A, a group of Pisces in London having a menu written in French. And so there was definitely something about mutton, a la Bombay, whatever that meant, uh, glass Parsi, some sort of Parsi dessert. Um, and some other stuff. I mean, again, this is London in the early 1900s, so it can only be so tasty, right? I mean, there's, there's only so much potential for spice and flavor that's possible. Um, but they probably ate better than the average Briton, I imagine. Uh, well, probably they enjoyed the spices more back then. <laughs> there's, I mean, this definitely does, does come out a little bit. A lot of people being very homesick, a lot of Indians being homesick for Indian food uh, when they're in London, yeah. Thank you so much, Dinyar. I hope I've taken up all the questions. If there are any more, please leave them in the comments. And you can always write to parzorfoundation at gmail.com. And I'll also request Dinyar to leave his email address. If, uh... Sure. I don't know if I, uh, if I can. Um, uh, I can. You can I can do that later on Facebook. Yeah, sure. Will do. Will do. And uh, okay. do join Thank us you again. on Friday. We've got a brilliant session with the Ghazal singer Penaz Masani. Thank you again, Dinyar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to thank you to 